You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a better player than a robot. Just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it. And I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the fourth part of What If Deku Enters Godzilla Verse. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of GFan97 on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Rando got into his office. He put his coat and tie back on and rubbed his eyes. I definitely need more sleep. Unfortunately, his current work was too important and too urgent for that. Instead he had to push through and hope he could take a vacation after the crisis was passed. Assuming of course that it didn't continue to get worse. Commander Takabana burst through the door. Speaking of which, Rando straightened his coat and faced the commander. The man looked as breathless and tired as Rando felt. Commander Takabana, Rando said, I've heard the news about Varen. The previous night, Varen had left the lake he inhabited near Iwaya village. Despite the efforts of nearby amp forces, he broke out of his containment zone and continued into the mountains. It was odd behavior since Varen had long been one of the easier kaiju to contain. We're working to figure out why he left and how to return him to Iwaya lake, said Takibana. But that's not why I came to speak to you today. His grave expression left only one real possibility. Godzilla, Rando said. We have his heading, sir. Two SGS have confirmed it. Where is he going, Rando said, leaning in. Here, sir. Rando's eyes widened. Here? Takabana nodded. Rando stood, feeling a sense of detachment washing over him. He walked over to his window stared at the bustling metropolis outside, at the jammed traffic, bustling sidewalks, and buildings filled with activity. This was the absolute worst place he could come, the most important and populated city in all of Japan, Tokyo. Rando took a deep breath. Both knew what would happen if he made it here. They were both familiar with what had happened in the past, but to happen in their lifetimes. Can you stop him? Rando said. We're doing our best, sir, but he's dead set on coming here. I don't know if we can stop him. Rando nodded. In that case, there was only one thing to do. Keep trying. I'm calling the Prime Minister. Katsuki stepped off the boat and onto shore. Finally. After learning of the attack, he hurried to Scaris on the fastest plane he could find to help with the disaster. In unrelated news, the useless extras told him they were all fine which he didn't care about because he didn't really like them much anyway. Unfortunately, when his plane got close, the assholes in charge refused to let him land. Something about him being difficult to work with, won't take orders, and is a total asshole. Granted, they weren't exactly wrong, but he still thought they were dickheads. It took Ponytail 2 and All Might hours to convince them to let him come, and he still had to promise those amph dicks he'd follow there and Ponytail 2's orders. He was one of the top heroes in the country. He didn't need to be babysat. He'd heard stories of the amph from heroes who worked in the countryside and mountains, mostly complaints about them being a group of glorified animal controllers who threw their weight around for no reason except to be assholes. While Katsuki had never actually met them before now, but he was starting to see why a lot of heroes didn't like them. Granted the Amph probably had reasons to dislike him almost everyone did, but that didn't change the fact that they were dicks. Also why the hell act like you're an army when you handle animals? What do you expect to be fighting, Sithulu? Despite this, Katsuki swallowed his pride in the same manner one would swallow nails and agreed to their stupid terms. He soon landed on their carrier and took a small boat to the island. He knew there'd been a bad attack, but he damn he wasn't expecting this. This looked less like a villain attack and more like a freaking typhoon had washed through. When he got to shore most of the extras Katsuki knew greeted him. Despite the mass destruction, most of them didn't have a scratch on them. It didn't make sense. This level of destruction had to have come from a ferocious fight, but if there'd been a fight at least one of the heroes should have been injured. Whatever? Katsuki could ask later. Right now, he had to figure out the situation. Where's the villain that did this? Not a villain technically, said Raccoon Eyes. Animal. 
Yeah, said Lizard Teeth. It was this big dinosaur thing. Came from the ocean and wrecked the place. The ant fought it a little until it returned to the sea. So it got away. Katsuki glanced over at the destroyed town. The intact buildings partly obstructed his view, but Katsuki could see enough of the rubble behind them to get the idea. All of this from an animal, huh? Katsuki turned back to his friend's colleagues and said, So what now? They won't let you in the disaster area without a protective suit, Lizard Teeth said, so that's probably a bust. Also, you're shit with people. Up yours. So that's a bust too. Because of that, we figured you'd be best helping to cook for the refugees. Yeah, Pikachu said. You were the best cook in our class besides Sato. Katsuki refrained from mentioning that was because he and Big Lips were the only two cooks in the class who weren't total shit. Fine. Lead on. He followed her through the camp, passing civilian and soldier alike. The Amph constantly glared at him, as if his presence was a personal offense to them. Not one to back down, Katsuki glared right back. Huh? Looks like they hate you even more than they hate us, said Lizard Teeth. Yeah. It seems your reputation precedes you, said Pikachu. Katsuki sneered. Plenty of people hated him. He wasn't about to let the useless opinions of a bunch of random extras. Katsuki froze as one particular soldier caught his attention. It couldn't be. The same curly green hair, the same freckles, the same overall shape and color of the eyes. It was him. Izuku Midoriya. Izuku walked by, passing right in front of Katsuki with his head in a notebook. His familiar muttering filled the air, the first time Katsuki had heard it since that day in middle school. Katsuki considered saying something, but didn't. Instead he stared after Izuku until he disappeared behind a corner. Yo Bakugo, you coming? Katsuki was shaken from his stupor by lizard teeth. He started walking after her again, not meeting anyone's gaze as he put one foot in front of the other. How do you do that without bumping into things? Izuku looked up from his notebook just long enough to make eye contact with Kenji before diving back in. Practice. He read his notes and tried to make sense of Godzilla's actions. His actions are consistent with what he does when another kaiju appears, but never at this kind of range. Could he be chasing one? No, Kenji would have sensed it. Besides, we had two SGS who never saw anything aside from Godzilla. Not even a stray Jazora or Gamines. Maybe it's something that can evade Kenji and our sensors. Sure hope not. Yami yeah, T, Izuku looked up. Did you read my mind? No. Oh, he was muttering again. They walked into Kenji's tent. Kenji opened up his laptop and prepped a call to the other analysts. The two groups needed to compare notes and try to find some answer to what was going on. After a few moments, the call was answered, with several of the analysts at the main base appearing on the screen. Sigusa, any new info? Kenji shook his head. No, no new kaiju found, no seismic vibrations, and no evidence of anything besides that psychic tremor, which only I could feel. Are you sure about what you felt? Kenji nodded. Absolutely. Any idea what whatever you felt was, Izuku said? No. All I know is that I felt it before he turned, and I can't sense it now. But Godzilla can, one of the analysts over the computer said. He wouldn't be moving like this if he didn't sense whatever it was he was chasing. Agreed, another said. But it's Tokyo, said a third one. He's been to that city so many times before that he's got to have some kind of attachment to it. Maybe he's just going home. But why didn't he go there before, Izuku said. We've successfully kept him away for decades. There's no reason our usual methods wouldn't work now. And why didn't he attack me? You all know how aggressive Godzilla is. When he's pushed, he pushes back. Something distracted him. Midori is right. This makes no sense. Maybe he was distracted by a kaiju, but it fled so now he's going home. Doubtful, Kenji said. His heading is the same now as it was when he left Scaris. He was always heading for Tokyo. What could be so important in Tokyo to that he'd be this dead set on reaching it? I don't know, Kenji ran a hand through his hair. Izuku sat down and clenched his fist and stared at it. I feel like I'm missing something. Something big. One of the voices on the computer sighed. Don't we all? Maybe we should adjourn for now and keep collecting data, another said. We're getting nowhere. 
I say we send one of ours to Tokyo. Kenji nodded. Good idea. I'll go there too once I'm done here. All right. Good luck, Sigusa. Kenji nodded. Let me know if any of you find anything. Will do. Keep us posted. Will do. Kenji ended the call. Well, that went pretty much nowhere. I know. Izuku rubbed his temples. He was missing something. He just knew it. Why don't you get some rest, Kenji said. It's been a long day and... I slept for ten hours last night. Oh. Izuku stretched his arms. I need to prep the mazers. I've heard rumors they'll want us in Tokyo for the battle. Yeah, can't let those mainlanders have all the fun, right? Kenji said. Of course not, Izuku said with a grin. Godzilla's our hunt. Kenji rolled his eyes. Of course you'd think that. It'll be strange, fighting him in the city, Izuku said. I've only heard stories of it before now. Yeah? Haven't done that since the Seventh Battle of Tokyo. Speaking of which, chasing the big G through Tokyo is how Oda Murakami got his start right. Izuku grinned and nodded. Yep, all the way back in 1954. I guess I'll be following in his footsteps after all. Just make sure you imitate the part where he survives the battle, please. Don't I always, Izuku said. True, Kenji said. Not that any of us can figure out how. Izuku laughed as he walked out. He rejoined his team by the mazers so they could do maintenance and make sure they were ready for battle. Just as they were about to get in to start running checkups, Izuku heard a voice behind him. Hey, do you know where they're preparing meals? I thought it was somewhere else but apparently was wrong. That was Chargebolt, Akakamanari. Izuku turned around to answer. His smile faded as he soon as he saw who was with Kaminari. He hadn't even heard of another hero arriving, let alone that one. Hello, Kaken. Zenakairo looked back and forth between Izuku and the heroes. He was used to seeing that look when heroes showed up. That glare of contempt and indignation. It was a common reaction in the Amph. However, he'd never seen it on Izuku's face before. Hello, Kaken? Izuku's tone was cold, with hostility simmering beneath the surface. Zenikairo had never heard him talk like that to anyone before. It was like Izuku had swapped places with Captain Sakaki. Dynamite was standing perfectly straight. He maintained eye contact with Izuku, but his expression was tense and his fingers were twitching. He was nervous. Dynamite was nervous. The guy notorious for his lack of tact and willingness to piss off literally everyone. If that wasn't surreal enough, the next words Dynamite said definitely were. Izuku. Izuku? Zenikairo looked back and forth between the two. How did Dynamite know Izuku's name? Why did he call him by his first name? And hold on, had Izuku called Dynamite Kaken earlier? Did they know each other? It's been a while, Izuku said, still glaring. Since middle school, in fact. Dynamite winced. Yeah. Izuku jerked his thumb to the right. Go 200 meters that way, then turn left when you reach the clearing. After that, keep walking until you smell food. You shouldn't have too much trouble finding it. Izuku turned around and started to climb up the mazer. He stopped. Oh, and Kekin, this is an amph camp. Your help is appreciated, but make no mistake, we're in charge. Don't forget it. Izuku disappeared into the tank, closing the hatch behind him. Lizardy and Chargebolt stared at Dynamite, looking as lost as Zenikairo felt. Dynamite stood frozen until Chargebolt zapped him back to his senses. Dynamite promptly shoved Chargebolt away, then turned and marched in the direction Izuku had pointed. His companions shrugged, then followed him. Zenikairo turned to his teammates. They gestured toward the mazer with expressions that screamed what the hell was that. Zenikairo gave them a bewildered shrug. Don't look at me, I'm as in the dark as you. You should go up there, Akane whispered. What? Why me? Zenikairo whispered back. Because you're his driver, you're closer to him than any of us, and that's literally your mazer. Oh, right? Zenikairo's shoulders sagged. Okay, I'll go. In the meantime, you guys go and do your checkups. They nodded and went to their tanks while Zenikairo climbed into his own. What kept you, Izuku said, not looking up from his work. Oh, um, nothing, said Zenikairo. The others are getting into their tanks right now. Izuku nodded and continued running his diagnostics. Zenikairo took a deep breath. Hey, Izuku. What? 
Do you, um, know dynamite? Izuku paused. That's private. Oh, sorry. It's just you two seemed familiar. Very familiar. Izuku let out an irritated sigh. We grew up in the same neighborhood, even went to the same school. He wasn't always the asshole everyone knows him as now. Zenikairo turned to Izuku. Really? He used to be worse, much worse. Oh. Zenikairo decided he'd prodded enough and turned to focus on his actual work, checking his Mazer's systems for any issues. For the duration of their checks, the two worked in silence. Katsuki walked along the path Izuku had pointed out, with lizard teeth and Pikachu trailing just behind him. What do you think that was about? Pikachu whispered to Lizard Teeth. I talked with that green-haired guy earlier, he said. He seemed really nice, even got our autographs. I don't know. Maybe they had a history or something. I mean, not many Popol would have the guts to call Bakugo Kakin to his face, and even fewer would live to tell about it. You know Bakugo, did he ever mention this guy? No, never. You know I can hear you, Katsuki said. Whoops, sorry, Pikachu said. Katsuki rolled his eyes and kept trudging forward. He followed Izuku's directions until he smelled food. Just like Izuku said. You should apologize to him. I think he'd really appreciate it. Katsuki snorted. Yeah, right round face. From how Izuku had glared at him, the only thing he would appreciate is Katsuki jumping into a volcano. When did life get this complicated? Katsuki sat upright in his hospital bed. He told them he wasn't hurt but they insisted on keeping him overnight anyway. The battle in Kamino was over. All Might won. Was All Might in this hospital too? If so, it was Katsuki's fault. It was all Katsuki's fault. He'd ended All Might. All Might, the hero he'd looked up to as long as he could remember. All Might, the hero who was always there and had always been there. All Might, the hero who never loses. He was gone. His seemingly endless career over. All thanks to Katsuki. Katsuki heard the door open. He looked up and saw his mom walking in. She sat next to Katsuki and wrapped her arms around him. Normally he'd find being hugged by her infuriating, but right now he was too empty to feel embarrassed. His father was there too. He joined the hug. Then the third visitor arrived. Katsuki, we were all so worried. Aunt Inko squeezed him as tears streamed downward like a fountain. She took a step back and blew her nose. As she did, Katsuki noticed that even while sitting down he towered over her. When did he get taller than her? He remembered her being twice his size. That was... That was when he and Deku still hung out. Katsuki's parents sat to each side of him while Aunt Inko stood in front. I'm so happy you're okay, she said with that earnestness she'd always spoken with. That earnestness that Deku had always spoken with. Katsuki grunted and looked away. He glanced up at the door as if expecting to see someone. This felt off, like a piece was missing from this picture. He turned back to Aunt Inko, feeling confused. Izuku couldn't come Katsuki, she said. He wanted to, he really did, but he, he just couldn't. He did want me to tell you that he hopes you get well soon. Katsuki was so tired he couldn't even bring himself to scream that he didn't care what Deku thought. Instead he nodded and said, yeah, All Might retiring probably broke the nerd. Deep down however, Katsuki couldn't help but feel he'd lost something important, like a tether he'd once had had long ago been severed, and he only just now realized it was slack. Rando had given the cabinet a basic summary of the crisis they faced. This forced him to cross several hurdles. The first was convincing a group of self-serving conflict-averse bureaucrats that they were about to face the biggest threat since all for one had attacked Kamino almost ten years ago without being looking like a deranged lunatic. The second was getting them, upon realizing the magnitude of the crisis facing them, to not bury their heads in the sand as politicians are wont to do. The third was convincing them to follow the amps' lead on managing the threat instead of whatever half-baked suggestion they threw out to make themselves look important, regardless of whether facts or basic common sense indicated the contrary. We are currently calling all available AMP forces to stop Godzilla. In the meantime, we recommend equipping the heroes with special gear so they can safely perform search and rescue, and to evacuate the city, Rando said. How much of the city, one of them said. Rando braced himself. Here it comes, all of it. 
You can't do that. Preposterous. Do you have any idea how drastic that is? Director Yaguchi, the Minister of Finance said, Tokyo is the center of our nation's economy. An evacuation of such scale could have grave consequences for the nation. Is this really necessary? I understand your concern, said Rando, but I believe the threat posed by Godzilla is worth the risk, and that the damage if we don't is likely to be more severe than the consequences of the evacuation, especially if the battle goes poorly. The plan you described involves driving him into the sea, another minister said. Why not capture or kill it? Surely if it's as dangerous as you say, then it'd be much safer to end the threat once and for all, especially with the capital at stake. The AMF has no plans to capture or kill Godzilla ready at this time. We do not wish to try to do either of those without a solid idea of how. What about the other monsters you mentioned? How can you be sure they will not reach Tokyo first? During the night an earthquake with a moving epicenter indicated Barrigan had become active while multiple Gargantua were spotted in various locations, along with the continued movements of Varen. We've analyzed their trajectories, Rando said. While it appears that several kaiju are on a trajectory that might also bring them to Tokyo, none of them will arrive until days after Godzilla, if at all. And why do you insist the AMF alone handle combat? Couldn't the military or heroes be valuable for support? The Minister of Defense said. The AMF feels that their training and experience makes them best suited to the task. The heroes and standard military are inexperienced with kaiju, especially Godzilla. They will be best suited for other vital duties, such as evacuation and disaster relief, Rando said. The Minister of Finance spoke again. You wish to evacuate all of Tokyo, a nigh-Herculean task. Do you have a plan for how? Yes, Rando said. There are emergency protocols detailing how to evacuate every one of our major cities in case of a threat like this. They're old, but still viable. The one that best suits this situation is Emergency Protocol 13F. The minister nodded, content with Rando's answer. Rando turned to the rest of the assembled ministers. Our heroes will be vital in this operation's success. However, time is short. We need to start as soon as possible. Rando enunciated every syllable, in the hopes of impressing on these officials the need to be quick and decisive. His presentation over, Rando sat down and hoped they listened to him, if only because they lacked any alternative. As the cabinet debated their next course of action, he gripped his chair in anticipation. Prime Minister Okachi clasped his hands. I will meet with the Heroic Public Safety Commission tomorrow and brief them on Director Yaguchi's plan. I will direct them to begin an evacuation. We will meet again tomorrow to discuss further details. Rando's grip tightened. That wasn't a no, but it wouldn't be fast enough. Okachi was a solid peacetime prime minister, but he was ill-suited for crisis. In fact, he nearly lost his position two years ago during an economic scare. Right now, his slow and risk-averse nature was the last thing they needed. Rando stood. Prime Minister, given the nature of the crisis haste is necessary. I'm well aware, Akuchi said, but we can't afford to do this sloppily. An evacuation of this scale requires coordination between the different agencies. Rando sat back down and stewed. This was going too slowly. At this rate, the evacuation would only be partly successful. That meant they needed to keep the battle as short and contained as possible. Rando would meet with Commander Takabana after this. Together they'd work to make sure the AMF was prepared. Once the meeting adjourned, Rando walked down the hall with some of his close colleagues, this is going too slowly, Rando said. At this rate, they'll still be debating when Godzilla steps out of the bay. Yeah, and what about the Minister of Finance, said one of Rando's companions. Bringing up the economy at a time like this, is money all he cares about? The economy isn't just money, said Special Advisor to the PM Akasaka, Rando's mentor. It's what produces and puts food on the table. It isn't wrong to bring up the consequences to a course of action, even if that action is necessary. Rando nodded. Besides, he actually seemed to care if we were right or not. The others were just blowing smoke. Yaguchi, what now? Rando's friend Shimura said. We prepare for war, Rando said. Godzilla will be here within the week. We need to mobilize every available resource for when he arrives. 
If you're planning to have another round of all-nighters, please take a shower, Shimura said. Rando glared. Shimura folded his arms. You can afford ten minutes. They entered the lobby. Off to the side, one of the cabinet ministers was speaking with Koku Hanabata, the populist politician from the Hearts and Minds Party, along with a high-ranking military official. What's that about? Izuku sat on a bench trying to focus on his book, hoping to quiet the tempest in his head. In the thirteen years since his first rampage through Toki. Forget their crappy quirks, you're totally quirkless. Godzilla never strayed far from the Japanese home islands. He... Don't even think of going to Uadeku. Then he suddenly made a turn for. Hey, if you want to be a hero so bad, I've got an idea. Just pray for a powerful quirk in your next life and take. Izuku snapped his book shut. What was with the past few days? First All Might shows up and now Kakin. Did the universe have a grudge against him or something? What was it with figures from his past popping up all around him to make him to relive old baggage? Who was next? Is Drill Sergian? You know what? Never mind. Izuku sighed. Why couldn't things be simple, like when giant monsters were trying to brutally kill him? He thought he'd moved on from his middle school days, that all that stuff was behind him. Now though, he was starting to think that maybe he just never had to face them. Young Midoriya. Izuku was yanked out of his thoughts. All might, Izuku groaned. Great. Just what he needed. More baggage he never moved on from. May I sit here? Sure all might, Izuku said. Go right ahead. As all might sat down, Izuku wondered what this was about. Another attempt to reconcile? No probably not. He understood Izuku's lingering resentment so he'd probably know to give Izuku some time to think. Then what was it? I saw you with the tank operators yesterday, All Might said. I asked another member of the AMF about you. She told me a little about your job and your reputation. Oh, that... Evidently you managed to take my advice in the opposite way from what I'd intended on a scale my students can only dream of, he said with a forced chuckle. I'm impressed. Izuku chuckled back. Thanks. I guess it serves me right, All Might said. I crush your dreams and tell you to find a realistic career, and you find this one. To be fair, it is realistic. Just insanely dangerous, Izuku said. Danger you seem to have embraced if your reputation is anything to go by Emerald Madman, All Might said. That's exaggerated, Izuku said. All Might gave him an unimpressed stare. Slightly, Izuku said looking away. He leaned back and stared at the leaves above him. Look, just don't beat yourself up about it. I would have found an incredibly reckless job to help people no matter what you said. If not this, then probably something else. I suppose so, Tashinori said. But why this one? Izuku shrugged. I hoped to become a police officer, but was worried I wouldn't get in. So, I searched for careers where someone like me would be welcome, stumbled on the AMF and thought they looked promising. And it became your new dream. Izuku shook his head. No, that was later. I went to a store and got this. He lifted his book. It's a journal written by the AMP's first and finest soldier, Oda Murakami. Izuku smiled as he said his hero's name. He fought Godzilla for nearly 50 years, starting with Godzilla's first attack in 1954. No quirk, no really exceptional traits, not even advanced weapons the first time around. Just wits, determination, and a whole lot of guts. Izuku stared at the book's front cover, which was a drawing of a man staring up at an all-too-familiar silhouette. Murakami did things that should have been impossible, taking on threats as powerful, or even more powerful, than any villain. And he did it again and again. Reading about him, it gave me hope for the first time. Maybe I could matter. Maybe I could do something incredible too. I hadn't felt like that in a long time. After that I wanted to fight Godzilla like him. All Might shook his head, and yet, he was smiling. All these years and you're still a fanboy. Izuku tried to think of a comeback that wouldn't be a complete lie. But there's something else I need to know, All Might said. You want to fight these kaiju to help people, right? You're not just trying to prove me wrong. Our mission is to help people. That is always my first priority. Not proving myself, Izuku said. And for the record, it wasn't just you. Izuku clenched his fist. It was everyone. No one believed in me. Not family, not teachers, and certainly not friends. 
I understand, said All Might. His face was still as stone, impossible to read. You said you no longer believed me about the impossibility of a quirkless hero. Are these kaiju why? Izuku nodded. Yeah, don't get me wrong, our gear and tactics are different from hero work. But at the same time, if me and my team can face something as tough as Godzilla with a Mazer tank, why couldn't someone quirkless fight a villain with support gear, Izuku said. All Might clasped his hands below his chin, nodding in thought. Plenty of heroes have weak quirks, Izuku continued. The kind that could easily be substituted with tech. Mandalay came to mind. Other heroes have quirks that only work in specific situations and fight quirkless most of the time. Like Void when facing a villain who wouldn't talk, I know it's be an uphill battle, but why does it have to be impossible? I see, All Might said. It wasn't an agreement, more an understanding. How many other giant monsters have you fought? Plenty, Izuku said. Killed a lot of Kamakuras over the years, taken out Gargantuas on rotation in the mainland. I've even fought Anguirus and Manda. Oh, I've even you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? All Might shook his head. Not a clue. I thought not, Izuku said. Suffice to say, I've seen a lot. America and Australia may have more monsters, but Japan definitely has the biggest. Interesting, All Might said. He stood up. This has been a very enlightening conversation. I need time to think. Good luck with Godzilla, young Midoriya. I hope they find him before he strikes again. Izuku narrowed his eyes. Hold on you don't know. All Might tilted his head. Don't know what? Katsuki trudged through the camp, through looking for Izuku. This was a dumb idea. He knew it was a dumb idea. Maybe he should just drop it, let sleeping dogs lie and... You should apologize. I think he'd really appreciate it. Damn it round face. You'd better be right about this or I'll kill you. On the one hand, Izuku clearly held a grudge. On the other, Katsuki owed it to him to at least try to apologize. Mama Bakugo, old hag that she was, didn't raise a coward after all. Besides, the old wounds were already opened so might as well try to heal them. If that didn't work, Izuku could tell him to piss off and Katsuki could walk away and never bother him again. The only issue was finding Izuku. Kaken. Well that was easier than I thought. Katsuki turned around as Izuku stormed up to him. Katsuki wondered if this was about their past or if he'd somehow already offended the Amph. On accident. Either way, Katsuki rolled his shoulders back and braced himself. Izuku walked up pointing at Katsuki, and said, Have they started evacuating Tokyo? Katsuki rapidly blinked. Wait what? Answer me, Izuku said. How the hell would I know what they're doing in Tokyo? Katsuki said. You heroes have a special app, HeroNet, don't you? It allows you to send messages and coordinate with your fellow heroes. Izuku's eyes, they weren't angry. They were sharp, like someone preparing for a battle. This was something serious. Yeah, but I'm not checking it 247, Katsuki said getting out his phone. What part of Tokyo would they be evacuating? All of it. Katsuki stopped. He looked up. Come again? I'm asking if they've begun an evacuation of either all of Tokyo, or a portion so big that it would require a Herculean effort the scale of which has not been seen since well before All Might's debut, Izuku said. You couldn't miss it if you tried. So has it happened? Is it about to happen? No, I haven't heard anything like that. Should I ha hey come back? Izuku was already walking away. No time, I need to find All Might. Thank you for your cooperation. Izuku wait, Katsuki said hurrying after him. We need to talk, I'm trying to apologize Gautamit. Izuku froze. He turned around and, for a long moment, stared at Katsuki. Then he turned away. We can talk later. Right now, I need to see All Might. Izuku hurried off, leaving Katsuki behind. Damn it. It seemed sorting things out would have to wait. Young Midoriya left very suddenly. I wonder why. Tashinori hoped he hadn't accidentally offended the boy. However, that sinking feeling where most of his stomach used to be didn't give him much comfort. Tashinori took a deep breath. In and out. Such worrying was pointless. He had no idea what young Midoriya was thinking. Besides, while sitting here, Tashinori had time to think. For instance, could young Midoriya have been right? Could it be possible to become a quirkless hero? 
Young Midoriya clearly thought it was, despite admitting he himself couldn't have been that. Not that Toshinori blamed him, he would have failed too. However, if young Midoriya was so confident that one could be a hero with no quirk, why didn't he consider doing it now? He was clearly brave, intelligent, and very capable. If someone could do it, it'd probably be someone like him. Perhaps because he was happy here. After all, just because you feel someone like you could succeed in a certain career didn't mean you wanted to do it yourself. Maybe young Midoriya had simply moved on. Toshinori should examine heroes with weaker quirks, see if there really were ones a quirkless person could stand on par with. Naitai and David would be a good start. But wait, David didn't do hero work for long, and he'd mostly acted as support for Toshinori. Did he count? Few quirkless people had the chance to work with a one-for-all holder after all. What about Sir Naitai? His quirk was a massive boon, but he had to use it sparingly. He'd gone into combat several times after his limit was exhausted and still come out victorious. However, he'd eventually been killed in battle by a stronger opponent. But that happened to many heroes, and none would say his death meant Naitai was unfit for hero work. Also, there was Naitai's apprentice, young Mirio, who'd managed to. All might. Toshinori turned around to find young Midoriya sprinting toward him. He stopped in front of Toshinori and pointed. He opened his mouth and doubled over panting. Toshinori tilted his head and patiently waited for young Midoriya to catch his breath. After several seconds, young Midoriya straightened himself and said, You need to go to Tokyo, now. I beg your pardon, Toshinori said. Godzilla is heading for Tokyo. He what? They haven't started evacuating yet, young Midoriya said. They what? You need to go there and make them start. Take the high-speed plane Kakin brought. You need to get everyone out of there. I, I don't understand, Toshinori said. What can I do? I don't have the authority to. You're one of the most powerful men in all of Japan. If anyone can force this issue, it's you. I, I'm one of the most powerful men in Japan, but my quirk no longer works and I'm retired. Young Midoriya looked at him like he was insane. You're the symbol of peace. No one carries the amount of respect you do. Heck. You're possibly the only hero besides Yuravity and Godzilla that the majority of the Amph actually likes. If you go to the capital and demand they do something, they can't ignore you. Defy you maybe, but not ignore. With the Amph behind you, they'll have to listen. Toshinori hadn't thought of it like that. He'd tried to avoid politics in his hero days, not wanting to get involved in something he did not understand or to abuse his status and credibility as a symbol. He rarely gave much thought to forcing politicians to do what he wanted, preferring instead to go straight to the people when preaching his ideals. Well, it looks like it's time to see what I can do in that field. No time like the present after all. Toshinori looked to young Midoriya. You believe an evacuation of such a scale is necessary? Young Midoriya nodded. Yes. Have you heard of Emergency Protocol 13F? That one, Toshinori said, the one that calls for a mass mobilization of heroes to evacuate a major city, with details for each one in Japan. Yeah, that one. It was specifically designed with Godzilla in mind. It was? Even if the authorities start doing it without your help, the heroes could use someone like you organizing them. Please. Toshinori nodded. With much labor and ache, he pushed himself upright with his cane. Straightening his back, Toshinori said, I shall do my best, young Midoriya. In the meantime, please try to be safe. Young Midoriya looked him in the eyes and said, I won't be stupid, which was not the same thing. Oh well, Toshinori would have to take what he could get from the kid they called the Emerald Madman. Toshinori gave the kid a smile. Young Midoriya returned it. Good luck, young Midoriya. You too all might. Toshinori walked away. He went to young Kendo and told her what he was going to do before looking for young Bakugo to borrow his plane. Are you sure? said Minister Asagi. Hanabata gave him the same greasy smile he'd given a dozen times today alone. Easy prey. Asagi was yet another hapless bureaucrat in a useful position. Hanabata had dealt with plenty. For the last day Hanabata, General Mashira, and a representative from the Hero Commission had been quietly convincing men like him to join their proposal to finally overthrow the Amph. They moved quietly so as to avoid drawing unwanted attention. Yaguchi may be a maverick, but he and his colleagues weren't dumb. 
Hanabata's strike had to come at the right moment. The heroes have defended Japan decades, Hanabata said. They've fought villains, natural disasters, why they even subdued the Meta Liberation Army back in the day. Why shouldn't they be able to handle a single animal? Large as it may be, it doesn't even have a quirk. Osagi looked thoughtful. Mashira stepped forward. My military can be deployed to Tokyo as backup should the heroes fail. I have every confidence we can destroy this animal. The representative from the Hero Commission nodded. The Amph are a relic from when we had too few heroes to face the challenges of a quirked world. We don't need them anymore. This is the perfect time to demonstrate that. You raise a good point, Asagi said, and if I support you. The proposed updates to your hometown's power grid will be supported by any hearts and minds candidate who wins there, said Hanabata. Asagi nodded. Very well then, I accept. Hanabata grinned. Perfect. Another one down. In the open ocean, marine life of all kind fled for their lives, scattering in all directions. All directions but one. Soon after, from that one, three rows of spines cut across the surface. Ochako strolled up to the familiar warehouse. It looked like any other, the sound of heavy machinery and the occasional explosion being the only signs that anything was strange about it. Ochako entered the small lobby attached at the front for visitors. Above the door was the sign, Hatsum Industries. As usual, there was no one at the front desk. However, when she walked up to it the screen next to the front desk displayed a crude face consisting of a simple white box with two dots for eyes and a simple rectangle for a mouth. Hello Yuraka, good to see you again, it said with a voice that was both childish and emotionless. Hello Young, Ochako said. Good to see you too. May's in the workshop right now, the AI said. She's been informed of your presence and will be out here with your costume shortly. After a sound suspiciously similar to that of a car wash in the back, Hatsune came strolling out, looking slightly less dirty than usual. Given that her hair was damp and she smelled like soap, it was probably not because she'd been taking better care of herself. In her hands was a metal case. Ochako smiled at her. Hey Hatsune, how are you? Building lots of babies. Speaking of, I've finished your new costume, Hatsune said, slamming the case down on the desk. She opened the case and pulled out a costume that looked like a thicker version of the current one beneath Ochako's clothes, with the addition of two pink gloves and a full head covering helmet. As promised, a nuclear disaster hero costume, May said. I couldn't find a workaround to keep your quirk working with the gloves on, but I did give it them the ability to retract if necessary. If you need to float yourself, the sleeves will also let you pull your arms to your torso so you can float and release. That's great, said Ochako. How much can radiation can it take? May's eyes shone. I used the levels you mentioned in your request as a baseline. It should withstand the lower levels you described for days. The higher levels can be resisted for several hours. The highest potential radiation you described would overwhelm it in minutes. Ochako nodded. The ambient levels were what you got standing next to Godzilla. The higher levels were that of the craters left by his atomic breath. The highest levels would be if she was theoretically hit by the atomic breath, which would also incinerate her. I also included high-level and low-level Jiger counter in the belt so you can measure radiation along with an in-suit alarm in case it starts to fail. Perfect, Achako said. Thank you so much. Anything for a loyal customer, Hatsum said. A piece of paper emerged from a nearby printer. Your invoice, said Jung. Fortunately, it will likely be covered for you by the Hero Commission. Ochako raised an eyebrow. Why is that? We have received orders for dozens of similar costumes from heroes in the nearby area and beyond from the HPSC itself. Jung said. There's a good chance they will do so for you too. Several costume makers have been contacted, but May alone is capable of keeping up with the demand. It seems the HPSC is preparing for the coming disaster. Ochako thought. If only they could do it a little quicker. Your costume made it even easier for me to design babies for everyone, Hatsum said. I can build even more adorable babies and sell them to all the heroes in town and the commission is paying for all of it. Ha 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 ha. Your project has helped us immensely. You have our gratitude, Young said. You're welcome, Hatsum, Ochako said. Good luck. Good luck to you too, loyal customer, Hatsum said. 
Have a good day, she said looking to Jun, whose digital face bobbed up and down in what Ochako assumed to be a nod. As Ochako turned to leave, she heard an explosion in the back. May, another voice, similar to Jun, said. The fabricators have finished two more of the costumes, I'm working on the designs for three more. Also baby hash 238's wiring was too volatile so it exploded. Got it Pelops Roman 3, May said. I'll be right there, keep up the good work. You betcha. Ochako left May's workshop and took the next train to Mustafu. After a brief grocery detour what, some of these places had great deals, she walked toward a familiar apartment building. While she walked, her mind returned to the topic that had consumed it for the last several days. Godzilla was on his way to Tokyo. While he hadn't attacked a city in their lifetime, Midori had shown her the aftermaths of multiple old battles. Not only that, but Ochako had seen what he could do to an island, from the towns to the mountains themselves. If he unleashed his full destructive power, it was hard enough to stop him in the Pacific, where their forces contained seasoned anti-Godzilla fighters, with some mainland AMP forces mixed in as support. Here though, unless Midori and G-Force arrived before the battle ended, the main fighters would be the AMP's mainland forces. While said forces weren't weak and had definitely trained for this everyone in the AMP did, few had actual experience with Godzilla. And in battle, experience could mean the difference between victory and defeat, between life and death. The heroes meanwhile didn't even have training. Not for something like Godzilla he was a living natural disaster, a primal force of inexhaustible power. They, including her, were just human. Fighting Godzilla was dangerous enough when your weapons and strategy were designed for him. The heroes had neither. Achako wondered what it'd be like to watch Midori's battle from the sidelines, seeing him spit death in the face without joining him. Somehow, not being able to fight with her friends filled her with as much, if not more dread than the thought of actually fighting him. Ochako was shaken from her thoughts by a familiar bun of green hair. Attached to it was the reason Ochako came to this part of Mustafu in the first place. Ochako waved. Inko. Inko Midoriya, who just walked her bike across an intersection, turned. Upon seeing Ochako, she smiled. Ochako, it's been too long. How are you? Ochako ran over. I'm good, what about you? I haven't seen you in forever. Oh, I've been fine, Inko said. I've been following you on the news. You have, Ochako said, her face heating up as she felt the same wave of embarrassment she had when her parents talked about her hero work. Yes, I'm so happy you've been doing so well for yourself, Inko said. Have you done anything memorable lately? Yeah, Ochako said, rubbing her neck. Not too long ago I visited a group of kids for a charity event. Most of them had faced discrimination for their quirks or, in one case, lack of one. Inko's smile faded. Really? What happened? The quirkless boy was a fan of mine. Cute kid. Mikumo was his name, Ochako said. She smiled at the memory. I'm pretty sure I made it the best day of his life. That's sweet, Inko said. Her smile had a sad undertone to it. She was almost certainly thinking of her own son. I've been talking with Izuku, Ochako said. He's doing good too. Inko nodded. He's spoken with me too. I'm glad he's happy now. But, she frowned. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, Ochako said. Izuku's job, the one you worked with him in. Yes, Ochako said as her fingers began to fidget. She hoped this wasn't going where she thought it was. Inko's eyes bored into her. It's more dangerous than he told me, isn't it? Ochako held back a wince, Inko knew. Ochako wasn't sure how much she'd figured out, but Inko was clearly at least aware that Izuku had lied to her about the level of danger he regularly faced. He'd let her know it was a possibility so she wouldn't be too unprepared if he died, but made it sound like a rare but possible outcome, rather than a decently probably one. Ochako was tempted to deny the truth for her friend's sake, but that would be futile. Instead, she simply nodded and softly said, Yes, a lot more. Inko sighed. She stared at the nearby ocean. I thought so. I don't know when I figured it out, but over time it's become more and more clear to me. I wish he'd told me, but I suppose I have no one to blame but myself for him deciding not to. Ochako raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? Did Izuku ever tell you what happened the day he was diagnosed quirkless? 
Yeah, he said that he cried watching his favorite All Might clip on repeat, asking if he could still be a hero. Did he tell you what happened when he asked that question? Inko said. Ochako shook her head. I apologized to him, Inko said. I didn't reassure him, I didn't comfort him, I just held him and cried. E when he clung to it like a security blanket, I never supported it. In fact, when Katsuki was kidnapped from his summer camp, I even said that maybe it was better he'd been born without a quirk, so he wouldn't be in that kind of danger. I'm not sure he ever forgave me for that. That's not true, Ashako said. Midori always talked positively about you. You gave him love even when no one else would. He didn't want you to know what he did because he didn't want to worry you. Maybe, Inko said. Or maybe he's worried I'd ask him to stop. Achako wanted to deny it, but she knew she'd be lying if it didn't sound plausible. Izuku didn't want conflict with his mom, but nothing would make him give up Godzilla. However, Ochako refused to let Inko forget how much Izuku cared for her. Ochako put a hand on Inko's shoulder. He loves you. In the four years we foe worked together, he always spoke affectionately about you. Between his friendlessness and his dad being overseas, you were all he had for a long time. He's always been grateful for that. Inko smiled, tears starting to fall. Thank you, Ochako. I needed to hear that. He's lucky to have you, you know? Inko's smile grew distant. I remember when you first became friends. He'd never been happier than he was then, telling me about you and all the trouble you got into together. Since then he's made even more friends at his job. Inko's smile faded. He's so happy compared to how he used to be. That's why, I'm not sure I could ask him to stop anymore. As terrified as I am of losing him, I couldn't bear seeing him like he was when he was alone. Ochako looked at the setting sun. Thank you, Inko. Did he tell you that when I first called him my friend, he cried so hard he embedded himself in the concrete? For the next month, I thought he had a crying quirk. Inko let out a wet laugh. That sounds like something he'd do. It runs in the family. Her face became serious again. Can you promise me something? What? Ochako said. If the two of you are ever together again, on the job, could you please try to keep him safe? I won't blame you if something happens, but... You don't need to ask, Ochako said. He's my friend. I promise I'll do everything in my power to help him stay alive. Thank you. Inko hugged Ochako. Would you like to stay the night? It's getting late. I'm fine, Ochako said. In fact, I came here to ask you if you wanted to stay at my parents' house for the week. Oh, why, said Inko. Ochako fixed Inko with an intense stare. Trust me, you want to spend the next week in the country, far away from the coast, especially avoid Tokyo. She'd probably be safe in Mustafu, but Ochako would sleep better knowing the people she cared about were as far away from Godzilla as possible. Inko quickly nodded. I understand. I'll go home and pack my things. Would it be okay to tell my best friend the same thing? Ochako nodded. Tell everyone you can. Goodbye, Inko. Goodbye, Ochako. Be safe. I'll do my best. Ochako hugged her, then turned around and walked back toward the train station. As she walked, her smile faded. She'd promised she'd help keep Midori alive. But what could she do against Godzilla? Toshinori marched into the building, with all the determination and purpose he'd felt bursting into a villain's lair back in the day. Given that he was in a building full of politicians, that was probably quite fitting. Toshinori had called and requested an audience with the Prime Minister from the jet. The Prime Minister immediately agreed, the perks of being the former symbol of peace. Toshinori just hoped he'd listen. Toshinori walked into Prime Minister Okachi's office. Okachi walked over and gave him a bow. All might. Prime Minister Okachi, Toshinori bowing back, an honor to meet you. The honor is all mine, Okachi said. You wish to speak to me about the animal coming here? Yes, Toshinori said. It's heading for Tokyo, I've heard. Okachi nodded. It is. We're doing everything we can to come to an informed decision for our response. His tone was stilted, like someone trying to perform. Toshinori eyed the man's desk. It was covered by a mess of papers, likely materials the Prime Minister was trying to read to decide what to do. He probably couldn't understand them, but it meant he was probably trying to do the right thing. He just needed a little push. 
I understand, Toshinori said, his grip on his cane tightening. However time is running short, I've heard the AMF recommended an evacuation. Yes, we are considering it. The HPSC is discreetly make preparations for such a move, along with a possible battle. Due respect sir, Godzilla will be here soon, Toshinori said. If we are to evacuate any substantial amount of people, we need to start evacuating now. I saw the monster on Scarus. You did, said Okuchi, his eyes sharp with interest. What was it like? Big, powerful, and dangerous. We need to do everything we can to ensure the safety of the populace. Failing to do so in Kamino was my gravest mistake. I can even help coordinate it personally if need be. You will, the Prime Minister said. Toshinori nodded. Very well, he said. I will authorize it at once. I will also arrange for you to be given a role directing the process. Toshinori smiled. Thank you, Prime Minister. Now the real work begins. Ah, this is the life. Denki relaxed by the fire, with Kayoka leaning on his shoulder. His other friends were there too, resting after the long day. That was hard, Mina said staring at her hands. I've got so many new calluses. I'm just glad none of us was hurt, said Ojiro. Yeah, Denki said. And some of you even saved some people. I was stuck on that boat, unable to do anything. Mina smiled. Those kids were cute. Kayoka lightly bopped him on the head. Even if you had been on land, you wouldn't have been allowed to fight. Amph wouldn't let us. Probably true. Even that green guy had refused to help them join the fight without hesitation after getting their autographs first, little weasel. Speaking of which, Denki glanced at Bakugo. He was still brooding. Denki frowned. He'd been out of sorts ever since he got to Scaris, and it seemed to be about the green-haired guy. Said guy had who'd been friendly to them at that exorcism thing autograph trickery aside. However, the moment he laid eyes on Bakugo, he suddenly became as cold and standoffish as the rest of the amph. There was obviously a history there, but Denki didn't know what. He'd been close to Bakugo since high school and he'd never seen the guy before. If it was from before that, then why was it such a big deal? Middle school were the days you laugh off about how dumb you were. How bad does their history have to be for them to carry it a decade later? Feeling thirsty, Denki stood up to fill his water bottle. Kayoka handed him hers to fill too. He walked to the nearest drinking fountain and began filling his water bottle. Oh hey, when you're done can I have that? Denki turned around. A slightly pudgy man a few years older than Denki grinned at him. He popped a candy and chewed it. Denki gave him a thumbs up. Oh yeah, sure. Once his water was filled Denki stepped aside. While the guy drank, Denki noticed he was wearing army pants and combat boots. Amph. Maybe he. Nah, what were the odds he knew the green-haired guy? Denki turned to walk away. Hey, charge a bolt, right? Denki turned around. You know dynamite? Denki nodded. Did he ever mention any old friend of his he had a falling out with from middle school, Midoriya? Apparently, the odds were pretty good. Denki shook his head. No, is Midoriya the green-haired one? The amph guy nodded. He ever mentioned Bakugo. The amph guy shook his head. Not to me, no. Might have said something to Ochako, but she'd never tell me without Izuku's permission. So that's how he knew about Mina borrowing her friend's money. Denki sighed. Okay. Midoriya, he's not normally like that, right? The amph guy shook his head. Never. At worst, he'd tell a hero to stay out of a fight. He's never like that. Some of the other guys are, but not him. He's a hero fanboy. Okay, Denki said. Why are some of your guys like that? The amph guy shrugged. The world worships heroes. Those with heroic quirks are praised. Those with weaker, more monstrous, or no quirks well, let's just say for a lot of people here weren't always treated kindly by the world. Denki winced. He'd heard about that sort of thing before, particularly from Shinso. Heck, it took him half the semester to warm up to Class 1A. Denki could only imagine what he'd be like if his life had continued the way it was before he transferred. A lot of people resent things they associate with their past problems, the Amph guy continued. The bullies loved heroes, so their victims hate them. Doesn't help that heroes get all the glory while we're forgotten. 
don't get me wrong, I think it's probably better for us not to be too famous, but, but sometimes it's hard to be ignored when you're fighting and dying. Even when it benefits you to stay obscure, Denki said, remembering a similar conversation with Shinzo. Yeah, pretty much. Denki took a sip of his water. Thanks for talking. I gotta go. Nice meeting you. Same. The amp guy threw him a piece of the candy he was chewing. Gee thanks, Denki put the one he'd been thrown in his mouth, only for it to refuse to break. What's wrong? Mighty hero can't beat a little jawbreaker? The amp guy said with a playful grin. He took another one and bit it again, almost certainly using his quirk. Oh screw you, Denki said while trying to hide his own grin. See you later hero, the amp guy said walking away. See ya. Denki finger gunned at him, then walked back to his spot. He took a swig of water. Denki? Yeah, Kayoka? Why is mine still empty? Uh-oh. Kayoka glared at him, raising an earphone jack. Denki. I'm dead. Izuku roasted an S more on the fire. It had been a long day, and he was happy to just relax on the beach with his team. Izuku ate the S more, savoring the sweet taste. Sometimes it really was the simple things. Like the warm flames, the moonlight on the beach, or the sound of crashing waves, why did that last one sound like a high-pitched scream? A couple of Sakaki's team were also here, but there was no sign of Sakaki himself, or his driver partner Yuko Tani. They're over there, one of Sakaki's team said, a big guy with porcupine quills for hair. He pointed at a nearby fire. On their own, again. Tani had been a close friend of Sakaki's before he joined the amp. She joined G-Force a year after Izuku and immediately partnered with Sakaki. They worked together ever since. It reminds me a lot of how me and Ochako used to be. I wish, said Zinni returning, because Izuku apparently said that out loud. Izuku smirked. You're just saying that because you'd prefer to watch me fight Godzilla from a safe distance. Zenny shrugged with a cheeky grin. Hey guys, Akiba said. Since we're all here, who do you think would win? Anguirus or Rotten? Definitely Rotten, said Hayama. Aerial superiority. Anguirus wouldn't stand a chance. I lean toward Anguirus, said Akiba. Rotten has to come to the ground to fight him and Anguirus is freaking tough. Rotten could just pick him up and drop him from a tall height, said Kisaragi. One, he'd have to avoid the porcupine quills covering Anguirus back, said Akiba. Two, Anguirus would absolutely hang on and starts attacking him in the air. He might even make him crash. Come on, that's totally a stretch, said Hayama. It does sound like something Anguirus would try, said Yoshiro. Also, he could use his ball form to hit Rodden while he flies low. Thank you, said Akiba. I vote Anguirus too, said Zinni. He's a tough bastard. Exactly. They all turned to Izuku. Izuku felt some sweat on his brow. Well, you're the kaiju expert, said Hayama. Who would win? Well, that depends on a lot of factors, such as location of the battle, the combatants' current condition, what abilities they use. Everyone groaned. There he goes, said Hayama. What'd you expect, said Yashiro? It's Midoriya. I expected him to side with Anguirus, said Zenny. I mean, he's practically Izuku's spirit animal. Everyone stared at him. What, said Zenny? He's just like Izuku, short. Hey has no powers, and occupies a station he by all rights should not have and fights enemies way more powerful than him while coming out alive due to sheer stubbornness. That's totally Izuku as a kaiju. They all looked thoughtful. Then one by one they nodded. Yes sounds right. Good point. Definitely Midoriya. Izuku wasn't sure if he should feel complimented or offended. Probably both. By the way, Midoriya, Kisaragi said. I was talking with my boyfriend a while back. You have a boyfriend, said Hayama. He's a mechanic, works on the big hardware. Utterly obsessed with machines, Akiba said. I'm pretty sure he's in love with them more than Azusa. Kisaragi punched him. As I was saying, he said something about how the Amph used to have better tech than it does now. You're the history buff? Is that true? Well, yeah, Izuku said. Between the worldwide destruction inflicted by King Ghidorah, half the world turned to cinders according to Murakami, and the chaos following the dawn of quirks, a lot of technology was lost, and a lot more set back. 
Heck, even Maser technology took until a few decades ago to fully return. We still haven't rebuilt our biggest stuff. Bigger than the giant robot that can fight Gargantuas, Hayama said. The one they use cheap wimpy versions of in the U.S. sports festival. Izuku nodded. Well, yeah, those things are big, but they're not Mechagodzilla. Hold on, Zini said. Stop. We had a Mechagodzilla. Izuku held up his hand. Two. Technically three, but the first was destroyed before it could even be activated. Are you kidding me? Robot Godzilla's, Zeni leaned backwards. I wish we had stuff like that. Yeah, me too, Izuku said. You just want to pilot one? Of course, Izuku said with a smile. By the way, Midoriya, what's with you and dynamite, said Akiba. His smile vanished. Kisaragi elbowed Akiba. What? We're all thinking it. That doesn't mean you can just say it, you ass. Izuku sighed. That's a long story. We knew each other in middle school. It was bad. What? He take your lunch money or something, said Hayama. Izuku glared at him. It was a bit worse than that. And Godzilla's only a bit tall for a lizard. Zenny leaned forward. He ever apologize or... We haven't spoken since halfway through our last year in middle school. He said he wanted to earlier today, but I was busy. Have you considered letting him? Izuku tightened his fists. Of course he had. He'd also considered slugging Kaken, ignoring him, and pretending he didn't exist. Izuku's mind swung back and forth between whether to try and reconcile with Kaken or blow him off. Part of him recognized that it was best to heal, even if he and Kaken weren't friends anymore. The other was still indignant about the ten years of misery and wanted to cling to that rage, no matter how self-destructive. This was so much easier with All Might. However much his words hurt, Izuku knew he always meant well. Kaken though? He'd just been a self-centered, narcissistic bully who enjoyed tormenting Izuku for ten years, until Izuku was a barely functioning husk who moved through life on autopilot. Grudges aren't the best thing to hold Midoriya, said Hayama. Take it from someone who knows. Yashiro nodded. Izuku glared at Hayama. This is a bit different than blaming a teammate after your brother is killed by Godzilla. This is actually someone's fault, Izuku leaned back. And for the record, Sakaki holds grudges and he's just fine. The guy with porcupine hair looked at Izuku like he'd just manifested a quirk. Really? You're using Haruo as a role model. He's functional, Izuku said. That time he punched a foreign officer and got punched right back notwithstanding. Midoriya, Yashiro said. Neither you nor Daimameet can change your past, but neither of you like where you are right now. You could at least try to bury the hatchet. Yeah, if it goes bad we'll gladly hold him down so you can wail on him, Zini said, while Akiba and Hayama nodding in agreement. Izuku groaned. He hated to admit it, but they had a point. He could at least try, and if it failed, at least he could finally give Kaken a long-deserved punch to the face. He stood up. Fine. I'll be back. Wish me luck. To the chorus of several good lucks, Izuku walked toward the hero's campfire. Katsuki stared at the flames, vainly hoping their gentle flickering would calm the minefield that was his brain. What would Izuku say if he apologized? What if it failed? Hell, what if it worked? Would they be friends again? No. Whatever their past relationship had been, they barely knew each other now. But at least they wouldn't be enemies. However, for that to happen, Katsuki would actually have to get around to giving said apology. This was a problem because both times Katsuki had spoken to him he'd frozen. Why did sincere apologies have to be so much harder than the fake ones? He wished he could just hit someone like he did that extra from the commission at his last apology. To Katsuki's side, Pikachu finished one of his ismores. So, back you go. Pikachu looked uncharacteristically nervous, meaning he was probably about to ask about a certain green-haired ex-friend of Katsuki's. Katsuki took a breath and said, What is it, Pikachu? What exactly happened to you and that Midoriya guy? I've known you since high school and never even heard of him. Because I knew him in middle school, you idiot. The insult was out of habit, devoid of any real bite. Pikachu seemed to notice. He looked worried. You're really carrying baggage from more than ten years ago, Pikachu said. Why? Even at the start of high school you were mostly bark. So, what you do to that guy? That's a long list. Katsuki whipped his head around. 
Izuku was standing a couple meters away, arms folded, glaring at Katsuki. He stuck his thumb over his shoulder. Kaken, you wanted to talk. Let's talk. Izuku turned and walked away. Katsuki stood to follow. He felt Pikachu's hand on his shoulder. You sure you want to do this, Bakugo? Pikachu said. Katsuki nodded. Pikachu nodded. Okay, I hope it goes well. Thank you, Kaminari, Katsuki said, using his former classmate's name for once. He followed Izuku away from the hero's fire toward the ants. At the midpoint between them, Izuku stopped. He turned around and glared at Katsuki. Katsuki glowered back, his hands in his pockets. It was almost funny, he'd faced thousands of people who were infinitely more than Izuku. Yet few of them ever made him this nervous. Despite his nerves, Katsuki would not back down. He made this mess, he was going to at least try to fix it. All right, Kaken, Izuku said. Let's start. Izuku glared at Kaken. Kaken maintained eye contact, but it was strained, like he was fighting every urge to look away from Izuku's hard stare. It was funny, back in the day Izuku was always so scared of Kaken, cowering from every one of his glares. Yet now he was utterly unafraid, while Kaken was the nervous one. My, how things have changed. You bullied me, Izuku said. Kaken nodded. I did. His tone was matter-of-fact, but Izuku could hear the guilt behind it. For ten years, I refused to look at my own weakness, and instead looked down on you. I made you pay for my own insecurities. Kaken hung his head. I'm sorry, for everything. It was real. Izuku could tell from the tone. His guilt, his apology, they were real. Izuku had once dreamed of hearing those words, hearing them now. It felt like a dream. Kaken was actually saying that to him. Izuku should be over the moon. And yet, he wasn't. So that's why, Izuku said. Beneath all that bluster, you were insecure, you? Yeah. My destiny was laid out the moment I got my quirk. I was the strongest, one of the smartest. I was destined to be a hero and rise above that crappy school. But you, even when it became impossible, you kept striving for your dream. At least until I finally crushed it when I told you to commit suicide. You still think it's impossible, don't you? Izuku shouldn't be disappointed. All Might was the same after all. But part of him had hoped. Izuku didn't say anything for several seconds. Finally, he said, that wasn't what crushed my dreams. What? Your words weren't what crushed my dreams of being a hero Kaken. In fact, that wasn't even the worst thing that happened to me that day. It wasn't even the second worst thing to happen to me that day. Izuku stared at the ground. The end of my dream had nothing to do with you. He slowly looked up and saw Kaken with his jaw open in what Izuku could only describe as a look of utter shock. It didn't? How? Katsuki was the one bullying Izuku the most. Of everyone, his blows were the hardest and his verbal cuts the deepest. That day was the last day Izuku still talked about being a hero. After that, the nerd disappeared for a few days. When he finally reappeared, he'd given up. All this time it was something else. Izuku jabbed an accusatory finger at Katsuki. Don't think I'm letting you off the hook. You still battered and bruised my hopes and my sense of self-worth until both were a brittle mess one good blow from breaking. The fact that you didn't throw said blow doesn't absolve you. The anger faded from Izuku's eyes, replaced by pain. Kaken, do you have any idea what it's like to live without hope, or even meaning? Did you? Katsuki didn't want to ask, but he had to. Did you consider it? My suggestion. I never made any plans, Izuku said. That wasn't an answer. I didn't mean it, you know, Katsuki said. That doesn't change how horrible it was, but I wouldn't have said it if I thought there was even a chance you'd try it. Izuku nodded. I know. My life felt worthless in that last year at Aldera, you know. For the next year, I didn't even have the strength to envy you. I was just empty. If it makes you feel any better, our dreams weren't as glamorous as we thought, Katsuki said. In my first year at Yua my class was attacked by a group of murderous villains twice and I got kidnapped. Even after graduating heroism can be an unforgiving career. We've all had close calls. Izuku nodded. I remember your first year. It was horrible you had to go through that kind of thing, especially at that age. I can only imagine what the life of a pro is like. 
but trust me, it's better to look death in the eye a hundred times striving for something higher than to live without hope or purpose. Take it from someone who's done both. What happened? Katsuki said. How'd you get out of all that? I found a new dream, and friends, real friends, Izuku said, a smile coming to his lips. What dream? It was hard to imagine the nerd geeking out over anything but heroes. Then again, Katsuki was preferred the nerd move on to the alternative. Izuku waved an arm toward the nearby town. Fighting kaiju. Eh? The words went through Katsuki's head several times until... You mean, you fought the thing that did this? Yep, Izuku said, folding his arms with a confident smile. But you don't have a quirk. But I do have a tank. You'd be surprised what someone can do with the proper weapons and training. Right, he'd been working on said tank when Katsuki first ran into him. Katsuki supposed that did even the odds, but it said something about how outmatched Izuku was against creatures like that when he needed something as excessive as a tank to fight it. Still, there was one thing Katsuki needed to know. How long have you been doing this, Katsuki said. Been fighting monsters for seven years now, almost as long as you've been a hero. There was an edge to that last sentence that Katsuki almost didn't recognize. A boast. You forbid my FR colleagues from joining that fight, Katsuki said. Why? Because they're not strong enough, nor trained enough, nor well armed enough, Izuku said. Izuku clearly believed what he was saying, but there was a proud edge to his words. Godzilla is our fight. Just about any hero would be, at best, useless in a battle. Katsuki narrowed his eyes. You like that, don't you? Izuku held his gaze. What? I spent our entire damn childhood telling you that you couldn't be a hero, and now you get to tell heroes to piss off while you do the fighting. Don't tell me that doesn't feel at least a little satisfying. Izuku glared. I don't tell them to stay out of it just to show off Kaken. They couldn't help if they tried. But would you want them to help if they could? Especially if you needed help? Izuku's glare intensified. But we don't need help. We can fight Kaiju just fine on our own. Katsuki could tell he'd just stepped on a landmine. Then again, given his past with Izuku's dreams, could Katsuki blame the nerd for being defensive about them? That wasn't an answer, but Katsuki decided to let it go. Instead he said, So, you like fighting these animals? Of course, Izuku said. It's been my dream since I was sixteen. Katsuki wondered if this, dealing with quirked animals, was a substitute for hero work, or if there was something more. Why? Izuku's eyes grew distant. Because, when I'm out there, fighting things so horrible yet so magnificent, protecting others, doing what should be impossible for someone like me, I guess in those moments I've never felt more alive. Some think I want to die, but it's the opposite. I want to live. Out there, I do that. Katsuki should call him crazy for that. Instead he felt an odd respect. It almost sounded like how Katsuki felt when fighting villains. However, he couldn't bring himself to admit that. Instead he folded his arms and said, Good, I was starting to worry you just had a damn death wish or something. Izuku chuckled. I've been in the amp for over seven years Kaken, he said glancing at the surf. G46. If I was this bad at dying, I doubt even a swan dive would do it. Katsuki flinched. By the way, after I went back to school, I always saw you coming early and leaving late, Izuku said turning back to Katsuki. Was, you know, that the reason? Katsuki nodded. Had to be sure. I thought so. Izuku felt his stomach coiling as he considered this conversation. The rage he'd felt when remembering the pain. The admiration he'd once had. The honesty in Kaken's apology. He felt torn. Part of me wants to forgive you Kaken, really. But all that pain left scars. Ten years of bitterness isn't something that I can just throw off. Not in one conversation. Please, give me a few days to process this. Then I'll tell you what I feel. Kaken nodded. All right, I will. But first, hit me. Izuku did a double take. W what? I said, hit me. Why? Because it'll let you vent and act as a symbolic final shot in all this, and I deserve it. Do you use violence for all your problems? Are you saying you don't want to slug me? Izuku opened his mouth to lie. Kaken raised an eyebrow. Right? He'd probably see right through that. It looks like Izuku had no choice. 
he'd have to hit Kaken. Izuku took a boxing stance and did his best not to grin. As Izuku readied himself, he noticed Kaken's eyes locked on his own. Most skilled fighters watched their opponent's eyes to see where their opponent was planning to hit. Kaken was likely doing this out of habit. Still, Izuku stared at Kaken's left cheek. He wound up. Kaken clenched his jaw. Izuku punched him in the gut. Oof, Kaken doubled over. You little shit. Izuku tried not to laugh. You did that on purpose. Did what? Izuku said in the most innocent tone he could. You're a shit liar, you know that? Izuku reached out to help Kaken, but Kaken batted his hand away. I'm fine. You know, Izuku said, that did feel pretty good. Kaken grumbled, but Izuku could tell it was fake. By the way, there's something I wanted to know, Izuku said. Why'd you start to hate me? We were friends. Why'd that change? Kaken looked away. Was his face red? It, it's really dumb. Izuku folded his arms. Remember that day when we were four and I fell in the creek? You tried to help me and I got pissy? Izuku raised an eyebrow. No? Why? That was it. I saw you offering to help me and I felt you were looking down on me. You, the weak pebble on my path, was helping me, the one destined for greatness. All the way through middle school I never forgot that day, that rage I felt when you... A creek? Izuku stared at Kaken blankly. You bullied me for ten years, made my life a living nightmare, because I offered to help you out of a creek, when we were four. Yeah, I told you it was dumb, you don't have to rub it in. I think I do, Izuku said, feeling oddly cheerful. That is easily the stupidest thing I've ever heard, and I've read about Operation Hedora. In fact, I've reached a new serenity brought about by reaching what is either a whole new level of rage or profound disappointment. I knew it wouldn't make sense, but I didn't expect your motive to be that plain dumb. I get it. I was a petty dumbass before you uh. Do you have anything else to add? No, I think that's it, Izuku said. He still muttered, a creak, a few more times under his breath over the next minute. As Izuku's mind continued its valiant effort to grapple with just how idiotic the reason for his lousy childhood was, he heard approaching footsteps. Turning, Izuku saw his team approaching. We wanted to make sure everything was all right, said Zenny, and if we needed to hold him down for you. It's fine, Izuku said. I think, I think it went fine. You both all right, Chargebolt Kaminari said approaching from the other side with a few of his friends. Yeah, Izuku said. I think we might be. And he actually meant it. Exhaustion began to seep in. That conversation took a lot out of him. I'm going to bed, Izuku said. Kaken, thanks for talking. I'm I'm glad we spoke. Me too, said Kaken, still rubbing the spot Izuku punched. Izuku waved to the others and began to walk away. Hope we all sleep well and don't have to deal with a Ghidorah-sized dinosaur again, said Kaminari. Godzilla's long gone, said Zenny. Oh good, said Kaminari. How'd they kill the actual Ghidorah again? Why are you looking at me, Denki? How would I know? I don't know, Kaioka. I just turned to you for answers on reflex. I think they used a special bomb or... Miniature black hole, Izuku yelled over his shoulder. We had miniature black holes too, said Zenny. Get back here, you need to explain. Izuku grinned and did not go back to explain. As Izuku got into his sleeping bag, he stretched out and let out a deep sigh. He and Kaken weren't friends, but they'd gone a long way tonight. As sleep took him, Izuku felt like an enormous weight finally start to lift. Izuku got up feeling nice and relaxed. He got up, stretched, and started to get ready for the day. He wondered what things would be like between him and Kaken now. They'd probably mild acquaintances at best since they barely knew each other anymore. Still, the apology was nice as was the metaphorical burying of the hatchet, and the literal burying of his fist in Kaken's gut. That was very nice. Once he was dressed, and had eaten Izuku sat down, got out his notebook, and started planning. Definitely needed to speak with Sakaki and Ishikawa about training their teams for the upcoming battle. All Mazer teams were trained for urban combat, but all of their actual experience had been in either in nature or small towns. They should therefore all go into the simulators to prepare for fighting in a real city. It wouldn't be perfect, but it would help. On a more personal note, this would be a very dangerous fight and Izuku might not come back. 
there was a risk of dying in every battle, but for this one those odds would be especially high. Izuku had to call mom and, Mom, Godzilla was heading toward the mainland. He needed to call her and get her to leave the city for a few days. Granted, Mustafu was in Shizuoka and should be safe, but he couldn't risk it. Izuku opened his phone and saw a news notification saying they'd begun evacuating large portions of Tokyo. On the bright side, it meant all might succeeded. Lives would be saved. On the downside, roadways would be congested, making it hard to leave without being on an official transport. Still, if mom caught a train early enough. Izuku opened his contacts and pressed mom's number. After a few rings, she picked up. Izuku? Hi mom, how are you? I'm doing great honey. How are you? There was an edge of worry in her voice. I'm fine, Izuku said. Things are mostly fine around here. I I spoke with Kaken. Really? How did it go? It went fine, Izuku said. He didn't know how else to word it. That's nice, Mom said. I spoke with Ochako yesterday. You did? Yes. I ran into her while I was walking home. We talked about, you know, you, your friendships, that sort of thing. She's a fantastic friend, you know? Izuku scratched his cheek. Yeah, she is. By the way, Mom, that reminds me. I think you should go visit Ochako's parents for the next few days, or maybe the rest of the week. I've spoken with some heroes here, and apparently they're expecting an attack on Tokyo from the sea. I know Mustafu should be fine, but... Don't worry, Izuku, I'm already on the train. Ochako mentioned something similar so Mitsuki and I left this morning. Izuku let out a sigh of relief. Good, I'm glad to hear that, he said with a relieved smile. I told you, she's a fantastic friend. Yeah, she sure is. That reminds me. Izuku, mom's voice became heavy. Something was wrong. Yes, mom? I, I know your job is more dangerous than you let on. I don't know how much, but I know it's worse than you wanted me to think. Izuku's grip tightened. How long have you known? A while. I don't I don't like my baby being in danger, but I also can't ask you to stop. Izuku's eyes widened. I know how much you love it there, and I can't ask you to give that up. Just please be careful, and please try to come home. Izuku felt the tears gathering. I will mom. Mom sniffled on the other end. You're welcome. I'm proud of you, Izuku. The tears started to fall. Thank you. Thank you for calling, sweetie. I love you. I love you too. The call ended. Izuku felt the tension leaving his body. Mom knew. Mom actually knew. And she was okay with him staying. Most importantly though, she was safe. With that done, Izuku dialed Ochako's number. Midori? Hey Ochako. I just spoke with Mom. Thanks for asking her to leave. You're welcome, Midor. Achako said, it was the least I could do. I know, but I'm grateful all the same. Thanks. I'm heading in now. They're trying to evacuate all of Tokyo so today's going to be a long day. If it's any consolation, the evacuation protocols do work. They're based on the hero's successful evacuation during the seventh battle of Tokyo. As for me, I spoke with Kaken yesterday. He apologized for being a dick in middle school. He actually did it. What happened? I think we're, I think we're okay. I still need to sort my feelings out. And we're not friends, but I think we're better than before. Also, I got to punch him. On his request. Midori, Izuku could picture her smile. I've got to go. I hope you can get here before Godzilla does. I'd love to see you before the battle starts. Maybe then you can tell me the whole story. I'd like that. Good luck Midori. You too Ochako. Izuku hung up. He got up and began walking through camp, looking for Sakaki. Come on, this way, Ochako said, waving the crowd on. The evacuation had been ordered the previous night, and every hero agency in the city was being called to help. Heroes across the country were also called in. Meanwhile All Might freaking All Might was coordinating the whole thing, making what should have been a complete mess into something somewhat coordinated. The plan was to clear the areas around the coastline first, then move inward. The areas that weren't being evacuated yet were told to prepare. Nejire's agency had been an absolute madhouse this morning, with heroes scurrying to and fro like frightened rats. 
Nejire barely said a word Ochako, just giving Ochako her position and sending off. Fortunately, Ochako was an experienced rescue hero, so she needed very little supervision. Ochako knew they couldn't actually clear the city on time. Heck, the plans they were using expected them not to, but they had to do what they could. So, Ochako did her best to comfort the frightened people and to wave them on. However, she wondered how much it actually did. She'd been told once that a hero's presence alone provided comfort, but right now she wasn't sure. Still, she did her best, waving them on with the most encouraging smile she could give. Unfortunately, when you had this many anxious people in one spot, there were bound to be problems. At mid-morning, Achako heard was a loud banging a few blocks away. Thanks to the years she'd spent around her parents' business, Achako recognized it as construction work. The crowd didn't. Was that a villain? Get me out of here. Run. As one, the crowd pushed backwards, shoving and fighting in the opposite direction they were supposed to go, swiftly becoming a human stampede. Remain calm, please, we're doing all we can, one of the heroes said into a megaphone to the human stampeded, but it was useless. No one was listening. Ochako saw a civilian fall down, soon becoming swallowed by the crowd. As she vanished beneath the sea of bodies, she cried out, Help him! Ochako didn't need to think. Using her quirk, Ochako floated herself and lunged over the crowd until she came to the spot where the person fell. She tapped her fingers together and dropped down, before quickly touching every civilian she could, floating them. Slowly the rest of the crowd stopped, the sight of all the people floating distracting them from their panic. Soon, all eyes fell to Ochako, who was standing in the middle of the floating group. Everon, Ochako said. Please remain calm. We heroes are doing everything we can to keep you safe. This is no time to panic. If you need to flee, we will tell you. She reached down and lifted the one who'd been trampled back to his feet. Are you all right? She nodded. Yeah, thanks, your gravity. She flashed the woman her hero smile. You're welcome. Ochako pulled the remaining people to the ground and touched the pads on her fingertips together. Release. The group staggered as gravity suddenly returned to their bodies. Ochako walked to the edge of the crowd and soon began directing it like she had before. This is a madhouse, she thought to herself. What happens when actual villains attack? An hour later she got her answer, when one of the storefronts suddenly exploded. Oh, come on, Ochako said. Would it have killed them to wait until the people were all gone? said a hero next to her. As the crowd scrambled away, two villains stepped toward the destroyed storefront. One was dressed as some sort of Buddhist monk with tattoos on his head. He sat down and got into a meditating posture. Glowing golden cords shot from his tattoos and began grabbing items from the store. The other one took off several layers of extra cloths he'd had. The layers stood up on their own, as if worn by an invisible person, then jumped into the store. Ochako snorted with disgust. Looters. She looked around to see if there were any battle heroes around. Seeing none, she ran toward the villains herself. Ochako gripped a car with all of her fingers, floating it, and lifted it up. She charged at the villain dressed like a monk, holding the car like a baseball bat. The monk villain shot the cords from his head. They wrapped themselves around the car and yanked it from Ochako's hands, lifting it over the villain's head. Smirking, Ochako pressed touched her fingertips together. The car immediately regained its weight and started to fall. The villain shot even more cords out to catch it and keep from being crushed. A hero dressed like a rock star ran up behind the villain, holding an electric guitar. Before the hero could attack, the villain sent two of his cords to stop him. While he was distracted, Ochako rushed in and punched the villain in the face. The car began to fall again, but Ochako slapped it, taking its gravity away. She kicked the villain in the jaw. The villain fell to the ground while Ochako pinned and cuffed him. Easy. The other villain and his autonomous clothes rushed the rock star hero. With a grin, the hero played his guitar in what sounded like a theme from a fantasy movie. Immediately, a team of knights made of solid purple light formed in front of the hero and charged the villain. The constructs made quick work of the villain, helped by other heroes rushing to the scene. Ochako left the monk villain in the hands of the reinforcements and went to check on the civilians. A few minor cuts from the glass they'd thrown, but no one was too injured. Ochako did some first aid until the medics arrived and took over. 
As the situation wound down, Ochako returned to her work, carrying on as she had before. And so, the day wore on, with Ochako going between crowd control, fighting villains, and cleaning up after battles. Finally, her shift ended. There was still much to do, but Ochako knew she needed rest, especially with another long day ahead tomorrow. Ochako left her post to her replacements and made her way back to Najire's agency. While she walked, Ochako wiped some sweat from her forehead. Nearby, she saw several bustling crowds and the heroes desperately trying to maintain order. It was a madhouse, and the real disaster hadn't even started. The two officers faced each other. Lieutenant Midoriya. Captain Sakaki. The two stared at each other for a long moment. Both young, yet both two of G-Force's most experienced, its best and brightest, and its most insane. Sakaki got out his notebook and sat down at a picnic table. All right, let's get started. You've studied Godzilla's prior attacks in the cities. Are there any surprises we should watch out for in the city? Tani stood nearby but made no move to join them. Izuku sat down across from Sakaki and got out his own notebook. Well, there'll be a lot more rubble than usual, which can clog the streets, making them harder to traverse. It can also rain down on tanks, burying them, so watch for that. Sakaki nodded. We'll need to try and avoid getting stuck, he said, especially since we use side roads to avoid being seen. Izuku nodded. There'll be more cover than usual. Cover he can shoot through, Sakaki said glaring at his notes. True, Izuku said. Also, Godzilla can and will knock buildings down to try and crush us. Right. When we hit the Sims, we should definitely grill the drivers on moving through tight corridors. The buildings will hide him as much as they hide us, so the gunners will need to practice relying on their readouts even more than usual. Izuku nodded. And how to predict Godzilla's actions from said readouts? Sakaki's brow furrowed. Yeah, can't let that bastard catch us off guard. What about his cues or ticks before he attacks? Izuku shook his head. The same out there as it is in the Pacific. All right then. First will. For the next hour the two discussed strategies, plotting out which areas would be optimal to lead him through, and made plans for training with the limited time they had. They worked in perfect tandem, analyzing and strategizing like they could read the other's thoughts. All right. Izuku put down his notebook. That should be good. Sakaki nodded. Let's find Ishikawa and brief him. He might have some ideas too. He didn't sound too optimistic on that front. Ishikawa was a skilled Mazer operator and leader, but he joined G-Force less than a year ago. Compared to them, he was a novice. They walked through the camp, Izuku trailing just behind Sakaki. Tani walked with Sakaki, talking with him in a low tone. Izuku tuned them out, flipping through his notebook to review their notes. This went on until Izuku crashed into something. Sakaki had abruptly stopped and was glaring forward with seething contempt. Izuku followed his gaze. He groaned. Press. Reporters rarely appeared during AMF operations, but when they did they were almost always a pain. Not only that, but this particular network, Subaru Star Network, was especially hated. It was notorious to the public at large for lowbrow content that made tabloids or even BS Digital Q look good along with a brazen bias toward heroes with stronger quirks and against those with weaker ones. Among the AMF, it was especially hated for portraying them as negatively as possible, regardless of their performance. Even worse, the reporter present was said to be so obnoxious that three different heroes had punched her. And none of them were Kaken. Right now, said reporter was interviewing Alien Queen, and to say Alien Queen looked uncomfortable would be an understatement. She had that awkward smile of someone who was trying very hard to be nice while wishing the other person would go away. Sakaki gestured to the nearest guards. Get that damn reporter out of here. One of them cracked his knuckles. With pleasure, sir. The two walked over, grabbed the reporter, and dragged her off mid-sentence. Izuku smiled at the sight while Alien Queen looked like she was about to laugh. Hey there, thanks for the assist Alien Queen said as they walked past her. Izuku waved, Tani nodded, and Sakaki, being himself, didn't acknowledge her at all. You could at least try being nice Haruo, Tani said. That would take time and energy better spent figuring out how to beat that damn lizard, Sakaki said. Haruo. Ugh. As you wish Uko, 
I'll be nicer next time. Tani gave a triumphant little smirk. I don't get why you hate Godzilla so much, Izuku said. He's an animal. Hating him is like hating sharks because they sometimes attack people. Or hating a hurricane for the damage it causes. I hate those too. Izuku groaned. But it makes no sense. Coming from the guy who I heard held a grudge against his middle school bully for over a decade, Sakaki said. Izuku glared. 1. Kaken is a person and people have morals that we expect them to hold to. Animals don't. 2. And more importantly, I'm trying to move past that grudge. Are you? Sakaki stopped. A flash of blue struck the ground. Haruo felt Yuko's grandpa dragging him. Haruo did not look at him. Instead he watched as the wave of fire engulfed the buses, the image searing itself into his young mind forever. Mom. Dad. The beast responsible loomed over the smoke and flames, like a demon observing its work. It let out a ferocious roar. At that moment, Haruo never felt more small. How many of your family did dynamite kill Midoriya? Can you answer that? Sakaki said. Izuku looked down. He couldn't. Sakaki started moving again. When an animal is too dangerous to be kept alive, it gets put down. Period. We've tried that, said Izuku. I've participated in trying that. But we don't try to kill Godzilla to keep others safe, not to punish him. You don't want Godzilla dead because he's dangerous. You want him dead because you hate him. I want him stopped too, but I'd rather do that without destroying him. He's one of a kind. You're naive if you think we can end this fight with him alive, Sakaki said. We haven't found a way to do that in 200 years. We haven't found a way to kill him in 200 years either, Izuku said. Sakaki growled but Tani put a hand to his shoulder. The rage ebbed from his eyes. Sakaki looked away. Let's go. They walked the rest of the way in silence. That's all we found, Sakaki said. Anything to add? As expected, Ishikawa shook his head. With their plans solidified, they could all grab their teams and... Excuse me, Kayoko Hoyu, Subaru Star News. Sakaki turned around. You've got to be Fu. Ah, 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 the Kayoko Hoyu said with a smug grin. You're on camera. Sakaki grit his teeth. Izuku held up his notebook to hide his face, and Ishikawa did nothing at all. We're wondering if you could comment on the heroes being forbidden from doing their jobs in the recent battle while the Amph hogged the glory, she said to Sakaki, not knowing or, more likely, not caring that Sakaki looked like he was trying to set her on fire with his mind. No. Comment, Sakaki said. Please don't deck her. Please don't deck her. Please don't deck her, Izuku thought. Really? Because we think that this was a grievous miscalculation on your part. Why, such stubbornness could even be what got several innocent civilians and some of your own soldiers killed. We demand an explanation for this reckless decision. Sakaki looked to Tani. She nodded. He walked up to the reporter and lifted his hand. Instead of decking her, Sakaki jabbed his index finger at her. I've had enough of your disingenuous assertions, he said calmly. Oh, that was awfully polite of. Then Sakaki decked her. While the reporter reeled, Sakaki turned around. Midoriya, Ishikawa, start training your teams. I'm going to speak with Gondo and make plans with him. Izuku and Ishikawa saluted. Yes, sir. And with that, they went their separate ways. Izuku walked back to his team as the reporter threw insults, whistling a cheerful tune all along the way. Ochako walked down the empty road. Night had fallen, and the evacuation work was elsewhere, leaving the street devoid of life. Her shift was long over, and now Ochako just wanted to go home, take off her hero costume, and relax. As Ochako passed the apartment buildings, with only a few scattered lights indicating people inside, she felt her stomach growl. She suddenly became aware of just how hungry she was, after ignoring the gnawing hunger for far too long. I should have eaten lunch. Looking around, Ochako noticed the flickering neon light of a convenience store, the type that usually sells food. Ochako rubbed her belly and stared at the light. She took a deep breath. She'd have to break one of her cardinal rules. She'd have to buy takeout? Ochako walked into the store, the bell ringing as she entered. She glanced at the few people scattered around the place, from the bored-looking cashier, to the pair of teenagers chatting by the candy aisle, to the old man slowly making his way to the front. 
running her hand through her hair, which she'd tied into a bun after finishing her shift. Ochako walked the aisles, looking in case she saw something she needed that wasn't food. The bell rang as another person, a guy in a biker jacket, walked in. Then everything went wrong. The doors blasted off their hinges and two figures walked through, dressed in extravagant outfits with support items attached. Villains. Ochako narrowed her eyes as one of them walked up to the register, grabbed the cashier and said, Open the register now. He placed his hand against a wall, causing the drywall to vanish to crumple into a ball, leaving a small crater. The other used a nozzle on his hand to send jets of water at the security cameras, slicing them in two. Ochako ducked back and grabbed a metal can of food. She held it with all five fingers cancelling its gravity. One of them was focused on the cashier, and while the other was looking between at the customers. However, he wasn't paying much attention. Ochako slowly crept forward and gripped the can. First, I'll go for the one with the cashier. If I can get him away from the villains, then everyone else can escape while I fight them. To do that I'll have to. One of the windows shattered and a figure in a long black coat leapt through. The newcomer rolled onto the floor and swiped at the villain holding the cashier. At his touch, the villain fell to his knees, screaming in pain. The other villain reached out to shoot the figure, likely a hero, with his water jets, but Ochako beamed him in the head with her can. The newcomer swept out the villain's leg and grabbed his arm, causing the villain to fall, also screaming. Don't worry, the figure said. The pain is temporary. Take it as a lesson that crime doesn't pay. The villains were both down. The hero began working at cuffing them both then stood up. Well done, a feminine voice said. Ochako turned. Her eyes widened. Ryukyu. In the flesh, Ryukyu, the dragoon hero and former top ten hero said with a warm smile. The hero in the dark cloak walked over to her and stood straight. Ryukyu, he said. Both villains subdued, none of the hostages injured. So I see, Ryukyu said. Nice work. Thank you. And you, he turned to Ochako. Thanks for the help, but you shouldn't interfere with your hero, aren't you? He said, noticing the costume beneath her jacket. Indeed, said Rukiu with a hint of humor. The zero gravity heroine Uravity to be precise. Oh, heard of the name, but I'm not familiar, he said. Ochako sized the hero up. Besides the dark coat, he also had had long black hair and a pair of dark goggles over his eyes. He was either an underground hero or an edgelord. Or both. Who might you be, she said. I am the pain hero agonizer. Definitely an edgelord. His quirk causes people intense pain, Rukiu said. Agonizer is officially a sidekick in my agency, but he tends work underground. I must say, it's nice to finally meet you, Yuravity. You know me, Achako said? Of course. I'm close with Nejire, and she speaks very highly of you. Achako put her hands together as her face heated up with embarrassment. Nejire praised her. To Rukiu. Thanks, she said. She said a lot about you too. It's an honor to finally meet you. Likewise, Rukiu said. If it's all right with you, we'll handle this. You've had a long day and deserve some rest. We will mention you in the report so you can get credit. Thank you, Achako said. She did not need more paperwork tonight. You're welcome. We'll be seeing each other again very soon. What does she mean by that? Soon Ochako was walking down the street, dinner in hand. As thanks for her help in stopping the robbery, the store manager even gave it to her for free. Now, Ochako wasn't the sort to use her reputation to get free stuff, but she was the sort to take free stuff when offered. She smiled at the thought of getting back home and sinking her teeth into some nice pre-made free food. Up ahead, Ochako saw a line of headlights traveling down the road. Her smile faded. What are those? Someone else said. Ochako didn't bother answering, but she knew. Traveling up the road was a column of Mazer tanks. The Amph had arrived. Goodbye, Mr. Fujimoto's grandchildren, Ikiro and Yuri, said. We'll miss you, alien queen, said Yuri. Yeah, you're really cool, said Ikiro with a blush. Awa, I'll miss you too, said Mina, giving the two one last hug. It was nice meeting you guys, she ruffled the two's hair and turned to their grandfather. Good luck, he said, and thank you for saving them. I am in your debt, you and the Amph Man. It's nothing, Mina said. Literally just doing my job. Where is Ozaki anyway?
He already boarded, Fujimoto said with a shrug. Have a safe ride back. The AMF were leaving, and the heroes were going with them. The HPSC would dispatch a plane to pick them up in the next day or two and take them from the AMF's carrier to Tokyo. Until then the AMF were giving them a ride. As Mina stepped onto the flight deck, she spotted a fat transport plane with some technicians working on it. It's no good, one of them said to his superior. They won't be ready for a whole day, he said. Are you sure? Absolutely. All right, I'll see if Command can get another transport jet. In the meantime, keep working on this one. And if neither works? Then we're thoroughly screwed. The only way we're getting to Tokyo on time is by air. The technician's eyes widened. Yes, sir, he dove into his work, going about it with the intensity of someone whose life depended on it. Mina frowned. This AMF group were apparently the one most experienced with that thing. Because of that, she really hoped they'd be there for the fight in Tokyo. With the heroes forbidden from fighting, they really needed every edge they could get. It was almost funny, a few days ago she'd be annoyed if she and her friends were forbidden from fighting a massive threat to the city. Now, she almost felt relieved. She still remembered her quirk bouncing off its skin like tap water. Nina glanced at her phone and opened her texts. She stared at the exchange of messages from yesterday. Ijiro, the villains have a quirk to detect telecommunications. I'll be going incommunicado for a few days. Good luck. Mina, all right. Hurry back. Text me when you can Ijiro. Ijiro, will do. Stay safe. Mina, you too. Mina let out a long sigh. She hoped Ijiro got back before the battle. She'd feel a lot more comfortable with him around. If he wasn't, Mina glanced over at Bakugo who was walking a few meters ahead. At least they'd have him during the fight. If anyone could give that big monster a run for its money, it was him. Nejire and Todoroki would probably put up a pretty good fight too. Speaking of Nejire, Mina wondered what Ochako was doing right now. Ochako sprinted into Nejire's agency. I'm Latam Latam late. Ochako clocked in, five minutes after she was supposed to. Damn the trains for running late this morning. She raced to the ready room to find Nejire and Rukiu. Her mind flashed to the night before. We'll be seeing each other soon. Oh, oh. Hey Ochako, Nejire said bouncing toward her, looking even more excitable than normal. This is Rukiu. She's my mentor. I've mentioned her before, right? Isn't that so cool? Isn't it? Isn't it? Ochako stared. Ooh. And Rukiu. This is Ochako, the gravity hero Uravity. I told you about her. She's not scared of anything. Rukiu chuckled. Yes, Nejire, you've told me. Several times. I actually met her last night. She helped foil a robbery with one of my sidekicks. Oh wow, you've got to tell me that later. I'd have you tell me now, but we have to get started for the day. I know, I know, Rukiu said with a smile. I'll tell you tonight. So, are our agencies teaming up? Achako said. Rukiu nodded. Indeed. We feel that this incident would be best resolved with maximum cooperation. Since we're not allowed to actually fight, we'll work together on evacuating. Nejire nodded. Uravity, she said, her expression growing serious. Ochako straightened at the sound of her hero name. Time for business. You're going to come with me and Rukyu to the Minato ward. We're going to oversee evacuations there and check on some of the older emergency shelters. I'll fill you in a little more along the way. Any problems with that? Ochako shook her head. Nope. Then let's move. They soon headed out and dove into their work. The day was much like the one before. Massive crowds on the verge of panicking, heroes desperately trying to keep things calm, and the occasional villain to stop. The heroes did their best, as did the police. While the newly arrived AMF mostly kept to themselves, several of their soldiers were sent to help. However, they were clearly out of their depth with a job this big. Heroes may not have much experience fighting kaiju, but they did have experience evacuating cities. But even for them, this was a lot. I can't find my mom. Ochako noticed the little girl wailing while two amp soldiers looked around helplessly, staring at the endless crowd. Ochako ran over to them and said, Hey! Miss Hero! The girl threw herself onto Ochako's legs. I can't find my mom anywhere. I've got this, she said to the soldiers. You handle the crowd. 
They nodded and continued ushering the crowd while Ochako knelt down. Hey there, she said, lifting the girl. I'm Yoravati. Could you tell me what your name is? I'm Hanabi. Nice to meet you, Hanabi. Could you tell me what your mom looks like? Maybe what her quirk is. S. She has brown hair, and it's kinda spiky. And her quirk is to stretch her fingernails. Okay, let's see if we can find her, Ochako said. She pressed her earpiece. I've got a lost child, says she can't find her mom. According to her, her mom has brown hair that's kind of spiky. Also, she can stretch fingernails for her quirk. Roger, one of the heroes on the other end said. Ochako then smiled at the girl. All right, they're looking now. Is talking to the other heroes your quirk? No, that's just an earpiece. My quirk lets me make things float. How about yours? My quirk lets me hold my breath really long, the girl said. Really? How long? Fifteen minutes was my last record. I'm trying to make it more. Wow, you have a useful quirk, you know. Are really? Yeah, my friend Sue can also hold her breath a while. Her quirk makes her like a frog. You mean like Froppy? My friend is Froppy. Wow, I like her. She's so cool. Really? Ochako said. The girl began reciting what she loved about Froppy while Ochako waited to see if anyone found the mother. After several minutes, they'd found no sign of her, meaning they shall take Hanabi where they kept the other lost children and search for her parents from there. Soon, a figure in silver armor appeared. Yuravity, I'll take the child from here, Ingenium, the turbo hero said. Ochako nodded. Hanabi, this is Ingenium. He's going to take you to other lost children while we look for your mom. Hanabi nodded. Okay, bye Yuravati. Goodbye Hanabi. Ingenium took the girl and jetted away. Ochako resumed guiding the crowd. Several pieces of heavy weaponry drove past, their sides marked with paintings of kaiju. I'm telling you, this route is prioritized for evacuation. It's the shortest route. And I'm telling you, command wants the mazers here, so that's what we're doing. Rukyu watched the discussion occurring in front of her. While the AMF and other services had tried to keep the other updated on their plans, some oversights were sadly bound to occur. This seemed to be one of them, with an AMF vehicle blocking a path that they'd planned on using for evacuation. Rukyu walked toward the conversation, Nejair by her side, hoping to resolve it. Yuriraka was a block away giving first aid to some civilians after a villain attack. She'd catch up to them later. Excuse me, Rukyu said. What seems to be the problem? The hero, a local one with a traditional Japanese theater aesthetic, turned around and said, We need this route for evacuation, but they want to park their oversized toy there. Toy? The AMF soldier said. That thing can punch through 45 of a kilometer of solid granite. Show some respect. Rukyu looked up at the vehicle, the Mazer, as they called it. It was truly massive, taking up half of the road. The tank had six wheels, a cockpit on the front with flashing red lights on top. It had a dark green paint job, with white letters at certain points and a brown porcupine-like creature with a rhinoceros horn painted on the side. The back of the tank had a turret mounted with a large cannon which ended in a strange satellite dish. Rukyu had never seen a weapon like it. Have either of you called your superiors to resolve this? She said to the arguing parties. I got my orders, said the Anth. You call yours. You first, said the hero. I intend to call my own superiors, said Rukyu, trying to be diplomatic. But it would be best if you could. Hey, what's going on? Yuriraka ran over to Rukyu and Nejair. We're trying to get these guys to move, the local hero said. We told you we were ordered to be here the AMF soldier said. Ryuku took a deep breath and opened her mouth to ease tensions when Yuriraka interrupted with. Who the hell's dumb idea was that? Ryuku stared at the sidekick Nejair had spoken so well of, the one who just torpedoed all chances of diplomacy. Not done, Yuriraka pointed to the tank and said, That's an MBT-92, a heavy tank built for open terrain. Look at this area, look at that corner. She gestured to the large buildings enclosing the street and the smaller road the tank was parked at the intersection of. Do you really think you can get a tank this big through that quickly? You're practically begging to be blasted. Ryukyu and the other heroes stared. What? 
What was she how was she Ryukyu turned to look at the Amfei, the notorious group filled of stubborn hero haters who picked a fight over anything. One of their jaws had dropped, one looked like he'd just fallen in love, while the others watched like they were in school and the teacher was talking. These streets are too thin, you need Mba 93s, they're smaller and more agile, better for tighter areas, 92s need to be on the bigger roads. Get your superiors and get these tanks somewhere they won't get blown up. You're fighting Godzilla, you need to be maneuverable or you die. One by one, they nodded. Then one said, we'll pass your advice along, I'll make sure to mention it's from you. They walked away. Rukiyu heard one of them say, how did she know all that? That was your avidity. Former member of Task Force 54 and partner to the Emerald Madman. Holy. Yuraraka glowered after them. Amateurs, she muttered before turning away. Well done, Yuravity, Rukiyu said. Yuraraka stiffened, then turned to Rukiyu with the sheepish look of someone who just remembered where they were. Oh, that was nothing, she said with an awkward smile. Let's keep moving. That was so embarrassing. In her zeal, Ochako completely forgot she was a hero now and ran her mouth like she was back at the Amph dealing with another batch of mainland rookies on rotation in the Pacific. Fortunately, neither Nejire or Rukiyu were mad. In fact, after that incident Ochako became the go-to mediator for disputes between heroes and Amph. It was kind of embarrassing, but also flattering. She wasn't anywhere close to some of these heroes, but they trusted her to speak for them, even some of the top tens. As for the Amph, they respected Ochako as a former member and usually listened to what she said. Some of them asked her to sign their gear. As the sun was starting to set, Ochako was assigned to help inspect an emergency bunker. She joined several other heroes to escort architects who'd examine the place while the heroes stood guard. Ochako was assigned to escort one with the hero from the previous night, Agonizer. Whoa, this place is an endless pit of shadows, Agonizer, ever the edgelord, said as they walked the empty halls. It's an old bunker, Ochako said. I don't think anyone's used it in decades. No one but the rats anyway. Ochako glanced back at the architect behind them. He was shining his light along a wall while checking his tablet. Structure seems sound. No mold. Minimal deterioration. Air is clean. Ochako smiled, remembering Midori and his mutterstorms. Ochako suddenly heard a child screaming next to her. She whipped around, flashing her light to reveal Agonizer pinned against the back wall pointing at the floor. Ochako shone her light to where he was pointing. You can't be serious. What? Those vermin are a pestilence upon the land. Unkillable plague carriers, he said, recoiling from a random cockroach like it was all for one himself. It's a bug, Ochako said. Cleaning crews will be sanitizing this place in a couple hours. You're fine. Yeah, but the cleaning crews aren't here now. Don't be a baby, Ochako said, rolling her eyes. She stomped the roach under heel. When you encounter one that's the size of a human with mandibles that can cut you in half then you can freak out. Do bugs grow as big as that? Ochako gave him a deadpan stare. Yeah, I've run over a few, and spent the next week with a mazer tank that smelled like meganil in guts. Those tend to prefer dark spaces, especially underground. Please stop, I don't want to hear that, especially down here. It's unholy for bugs to get that big. Oh, trust me, bugs can get much bigger than that. She turned and started walking away. H how much hey wait, you can't just leave me with that. Ochako just left him with that. They descended deeper. This place had probably once been packed with refugees, now it was silent as a tomb, with stained concrete walls covered in dust and grime. This bunker was one of many that had been built around Tokyo. Most had fallen into disuse after decades of not being needed. Relics of a bygone age, old history waiting to be forgotten. Now it seemed, their time had returned. Why do you think they built so many shelters in Tokyo, said Agonizer? And why so big? I get the dawn of quirks and the century of hell had a lot of crime, but this? It's almost like they wanted the whole city to take cover. Ochako shined her light on a wall and saw a child's drawing in faded marker. It was a dinosaur with a row of jagged spines on its back. Maybe they did, she said. Eventually the bunker was deemed safe and the heroes exited while the architects continued their work. Outside was a massive crowd in front of some evacuation buses. 
people pushed and shoved their way to the front. This was a powder keg, and a single spark could. Boom! Four villains emerged from a bank, one dressed as a cowboy, another as a spaceman, one as a robot and one as a knight. Beware modern world, for we are the tide of history. You cannot escape your past, nor prevent the future, now. The crowd began to scream. Ochako sprinted forward and began bringing her hands together. Prepare to oof. Before Ochako could do anything, Rukiu flew down in her dragon form and pinned the knight while Nejire blasted the spaceman. The cowboy pointed a support weapon at them but was tied up by his own clothes while the robot was enveloped in a layer of ice. Ochako looked up and saw Best Genus on a rooftop while Shoto stood on a nearby street, both giving the villains a cold glare. The crowd erupted in applause, their fear long forgotten in the face of some of the top heroes. They just stopped them in seconds. Ochako had seen Nejire in action before, but she'd forgotten just how incredible the top ten, former or otherwise, really were. Truly the cream of the crop. Next to Ochako, Agonizer folded his arms. Every time I think I'm strong, I reminded how much those guys put us to shame. Ochako nodded. Always something bigger. Too bad they're not gonna fight that thing, Agonizer said. They'd kick its ass for sure. You're wrong. Ochako's phone pinged with an update from the hero net. She checked her updates. Her phone clattered to the ground. Oh no. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 5. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author gfan97 on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.